In Ruth chapter 4, the final chapter, the rise of the Redeemer. So we're going to read the whole scripture. Yep. Boaz went to the town gate. He told in chapter 3 to Ruth, I will do the right thing. Yep, I'm an honorable man. You are an honorable woman. I will do the right thing tomorrow. I will look into it. Yep. So Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. Now the town gate, some of you say, what's the go to the town gate for? Town gate is where the elders would sit down to adjudicate matters relating to people's issues or cases they have against each other. And so he went to the town gate, took a seat there, just then the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. So boys called out to him, come over here and sit down, friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat together. Then Boaz called 10 leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. And Boaz said to the family redeemer, You know Naomi who came back from Moab? She's selling the land that belonged to our relative Eli Malak. I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away because I'm next in line to redeem it after you. The man replied, All right, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz told him the extra clause, you know, in any contract. When you buy the land, you've got to get a woman. Yeah, so he says, Look, you purchase a land from Naomi, also requires you marry Ruth. She's like, I just want a land, I don't want another wife. Okay, the Moabite widow. Okay, Boaz was smart, he emphasized the Moabite widow. Yeah? Because the Israelites don't want ngamki with the Moabites, right? You know, Ruth, he said, which Ruth? The one down on number five house. No, the Moabite widow. Yep. That way, she can have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. Then, I can't redeem it, the family redeemer replied, because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land, I cannot do it. Now, in those days, it was a custom in Israel. Now, that's why when you read the Bible, the purpose is right so that you know in those days, yep, anyone transferring a right of purchase to, re to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party, just imagine if you go to a lawyer's office and then take off your shoes and pass it to Angeline who pass it to the other party, <laughs> right? <laughs> that would be interesting. This publicly validated the transaction, okay? It's like a consideration given. So the other family redeemer drew off his sender as he said to Boaz, you buy the land. And Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, you are witnesses that today I bought from Naomi all the property of Eli, Malak, Kilian, and Mahlon. And with the land, I have a quiet roof, the mobile widow of Melon to be my wife. Just imagine you're standing there. You all see this sleeper? The land is mine. And it's roof too. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So it's always good to make sure your shoes smell nice back then. This way, she can have a son to carry on the family name. I tell you, I read this one. Uh, a few times, I was telling Pastor Kareem, man, this guy has a lot of faith. You, know, you all know, right? When you uh, try and get people pregnant, it's a 50-50 thing, right, boy or girl? But he says, this way she can have a son. He's like, wow. Chun, man, this guy. And he's much older than Ruth, right? We all know that from earlier. How do you know that? Because he called her daughter. Okay? Yeah, so they can carry, carry the family name of dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You are all witnesses today. The elders and all people standing in the gate reply, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nations of Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. May the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who will be like those of our ancestors, Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. So Boaz took Ruth into his home. She became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. She gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided. Yeah. From the time when they pray and their blessing, that's the, last, that's the next time the word Lord is used. So chapter 2, chapter 3, there's no mention of the word Lord. Yeah. 
who has provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast. She cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor women said, Now at last Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. And he became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. This is the genealogical record of their ancestors, Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Abinadab. Abinadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. And some of you say, who is David? King David. So that's the important line that we see here. Okay, so today we are talking basically a kinsman redeemer. What is a kinsman redeemer? The name itself tells you, uh, you know, who is related to it. And the word redeemer tells you what is that occupation or the obligation or responsibility. So kinsman means kakilang. Na. Yeah, that means you have to be of the same clan. You have, to be, have the close family tie. Then you can say kinsman. Yeah, to be a kinsman, you got a responsibility. What responsibility? You have to be the redeemer. Redeem what? Redemption of property. If somehow the your relative you know fall in bad times and they had to sell off their property, yep, the redeemer, the kinsman can redeem back that property. Okay, that's important. The other one is redemption of person. He redeems a relative who are forced to sell themselves into slavery, buys him out of slavery and sets him free. Yep, redemption of blood. Yeah, if you know avenge for someone who was killed, a relative that was killed. And of course, the last one is the leverage, marriage. The right of redemption and the office belong to the nearest kinsman. Yep. So back in those days, if you're a kinsman, yeah, you have a really heavy responsibility to stand for your relative. Yep. Today, it's a different thing altogether. Um, so what is leverage marriage? It takes place when a man dies, no male children, his brother or, an, or another relative closest is to marry the widow and father a son for the deceased brother. It is a practice of raising up a son for the deceased relative. But I'm going to look today at four or five characters here who is involved in this story so that we can see the character traits that comes out that we can attain it. I know we can talk about it very long about different things, but if we look at characters or the people in this situation, we can gain more things itself. Amen? In the chapter 4, if you notice, there is no mention of, uh, no showing of Ruth speaking at all. Do you notice that? In fact, actually, if you look at the whole book of Ruth, everything that Ruth did is for other people. Yeah? She followed Naomi. She did it for Naomi. She went out to glean for Naomi. Yeah? She is, everything is for Naomi. Even to get married and be, make that proposal also for Naomi because it's, it's basically nothing for Ruth. It's, and if you could say, you know, in one sense, uh, Ruth was a, a servant, yeah, a willing servant. And that's the challenge. You, know, you have to be there. So the first person I want to see here is this called the Poloni Almoni. Okay, polonial moni basically means concealed and muted. Yeah. Yeah. Concealed and muted. In other words, it is the unnamed relative. They didn't name the relative. Yep. In that story, we can see Boaz calling, hey, friend, come. If you know the relative's name, you will call, hey, Abing, or someone, but you call friend. Okay, in the story, they did not name the relative at all. But the Midrash, Midrash does mention it in the Jewish archives. But it is not mentioned in scripture. Basically, it's what we call Peloni Almoni. In other words, it is not necessary to name. It is hidden. Yep. For a purpose, we can look into it. Uh, there is one occasion, this word is also used, when David was being chased uh, by Saul. And yet the high priest asked him, where are you going next? And David said, Peloni Almoni la. Somewhere there. <laughs> yep. I name one other place. So in English, we could say basically it sounds like John Doe. That John Doe. Okay, you don't name it. And so this Peloni Almoni, this relative, was self-seeking. Okay, let me go through quickly. He's quick to say, hey, I want to buy the land because it's going to profit him. An extra land. 
Okay, he would actually have known the situation with Ruth and Naomi, but he has not asked, you know, about what would happen to them. He seems like he has doesn't care. Yeah, he's the closest relative, but for the first three chapters, he's not even once mentioned. And he does not even ask about their welfare, doesn't even ask Ruth to glean in his field or to tell Naomi that, go. He ignores them. So the real name was excluded as a consequence of not having discharged his duty as Ruth's redeemer. He could have been essentially good. We're not saying he's a bad person. According to the Midrash, he's a good guy. But good doesn't cut it when we don't live out the spiritual objective that God has given. That is so important. He rejected the chance to redeem Ruth and pass up the opportunity for greatness. Yeah. There are a lot of good Christians, but we do the good things that we want to do and we don't do the God things that God wants us to do and we miss that opportunity. He did what was acceptable in the eyes of the law, but spiritually and morally, he didn't do it. There's a lack of humanity in seeing another in need of mercy and that failed him. He lost that destiny, the relevance, that goodness, his name. Boaz was willing to give him the first chance to redeem. Then he will not be Boaz and Ruth. He will be this other guy. What's so important, he said, they became the lineage where King David came about. And it's so important to know because down the line, that's where Jesus came about. From the line of David. And that's so important. And that's why the scripture reminds us, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. He was looking for the land. He was not looking more than that. And therefore, a good name is so important. If he had chosen to take the land and roof, his name will be there. He will not be Poloni Almoni. Not necessary to name hidden, muted. Who is that relative? Shh. No need to say. Miss the boat. You know, when I was in law office last night, I remember my boss telling me, Elvin, lose money, huh? acceptable. Don't you lose the reputation of the office. Don't you lose the reputation of your name. And I think it applies to all of you who have business, right? You lose, okay, like, you lose that deal, like 1,000, 2,000 or whatever it is. But don't lose the name of yourself and the company. And likewise, your name means important. Today, back in those days, name is very important. Your name represents something. Yeah. So now we're going to look at the other person of course, it's Boaz. We all know that he is magnanimous, he is a worthy man, and a man of substance and of character. And we see that manifested in his actions. He was proactive. He took initiative. He told Ruth, look, I will look into it. And the next day he went. Yeah, because a lot of people like to procrastinate. Uh, we la, next week, la, soon, la, coming soon. Have you signed up for the workshop? Soon, la, we la, we la. Have you paid for the thing? Soon, la, we la. And procrastination is a thief of time. Boaz was someone that was proactive. A normal man who said, I will do it and I will look into it. And he did it. And that's so important. He's a man of action. He is capable and responsible. Two key words for those of you who are planning to get married. Capable and responsible. Yeah, otherwise postpone your wedding. Even if you paid deposit for your dinner. Better to pay deposit and cancel it than to pay after that. Alimony is very expensive. Huh? Some people say, Pastor, why are you not happy to get married? No, must get married rightly. Right. Capable and responsible. In other words, when you get married, you know, showing rings on Facebook, all that is great. But capable and responsible. Understand that when you walk in a relationship, you are going to be responsible for that other person that comes into your life. Parents will say, you make sure you find the right girl, guy. Huh? Parents, you also make sure your son or daughter is the right person for the person. Because we think our children can have no fault one. The darling... Not of God's eyes, but of our eyes. And that is so important. It's not about you know, finding the right person only. It's being the right person. And one of it is that. Understand there is a responsibility that you're going to carry now. A new relationship, a home, 
and the capability to deal with problems and conflicts and issues that comes. Last time dating, quarterly, don't talk one month lah. Right. But now Mary Lee rent a studio apartment, sleep outside in the corridor. Can't. Capable, responsible are two important qualities we need. And Boaz was one who was capable, man of substance, one who understood responsibility and paid that. So he did not procrastinate. He understood someone's future was at stake. Naomi and Ruth was waiting for him to take action. When you plan to get married, someone's future at stake because they marry you. <laughs> Hello? Good sermon for wedding. Yeah? Think about that. No wishy-washy. He was open and transparent. Yeah? Smart guy. I'm going to bring 10 witnesses. He's out in the public. Not just 10 elders who are there to witness, but a lot of busybody will be there also. Right? Like Bios tells us in that story, there are a lot of people standing around. There are always people interested to know. And... The scripture tells us very clearly, whoever practices the truth comes into the light. If you are one who walks in the truth, then walk in the light. So that it may be clearly seen that what he has done has been accomplished in God. Did Boaz do that? Yes. He brought it in the open. He asked the other fellow redeemer, do you want? If you don't want, pass to me. Everybody seen it. The elders confirm it. The other KPC also confirm. Yeah. So nothing is hidden. If you had to hide do something behind, then you're operating in darkness. A voice was open and transparent. 1 John 5, 7 says this, this is a message we heard from him. God is like in him there is no darkness at all. In at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies from all sin. We see in the next thing, Boaz was one who clearly and graciously communicated. Yep. That is seen in how he communicated throughout the whole process in the first few verses with the elders, with the other fellow redeemer. And it's a reflection of who he is. Luke 6.45, a good man brings out good things out of the good store in his heart and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil store in his heart for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Remember the illustration I used uh, if you put tomato ketchup in those squeezy bottle, right? And you had a hot dog, then you squeeze it out. And sometimes it gets stuck, but you squeeze it out. Likewise, whatever you put inside, you squeeze it out. So, so if you put that squeezy bottle there and you just right now squeeze it with both hands, you have this fountain go soup. And the Bible tells us, you know, in this life, we will be squeezed and pressed from all sides, but not destroyed. Yeah? We will be pressured. And you know when we are pressured, we are like a squeezy bottle. What's inside comes out. Yeah? And so therefore, that's why our, the issue of the heart, the abundance of the heart, God wants to deal in the heart so that when it's squeezed out, comes forgiveness, comes kindness, comes goodness. I'm not saying that now you squeeze me, comes out kindness and I'm a care bear. You know the care bear children want? No luck. We all have the times when people squeeze us, all in a highway or when people drive, people cut you, you are squeezed straight away, you sign, speak sign languages, right? Yeah. Like I remember one pastor was telling me someone was driving him, a church man driving him, someone cut him, and that guy suddenly, the, this church member put his hand right in front of the pastor's face to point to the other driver and give a sign language to the other driver. Then he was like, he said, we are all squeezed daily in our jobs, in our work. You might not want to reflect that squeeze in front of other people. But when you go to the bathroom, it squeeze out yeah, as you flush the toilet. So understanding this is so important. That's why God wants to deal in our heart. That's why the word of God has to dwell richly in our hearts so that a change can happen. Amen. So let your speech be always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know you how you ought to answer each other. And of course, number four, he was a selfless redeemer. As much as he, I believe, had interest in Ruth, I think he must be praying very hard. Let this guy say no. Let this guy say no. Yep. But he was a selfless redeemer. He gave that guy the first choice. What is redeem? To buy back. 
Yeah, that is the most basic word. Of course, if we align that to spiritual things and what Christ has done, redemption means the work of Christ on behalf. He purchases, he ransoms us at the price of his own life, securing our deliverance from the bondage and condemnation of sin. He delivered us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Redemption. So we're going to look at, when we talk about selfless redeemer, Boaz is a type of Christ. And we can see the same thing in the work of Christ. Firstly, if you look at the story, there can only be one redeemer. See, the other guy has to say no. Otherwise, there are two of them who wants roof, a bit hit chaos. Can only be one redeemer. They could not both, not both of them cannot redeem roof. And likewise, Jesus is the only one who is qualified to redeem us. He is the only one who can save us. In, Christ, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. No other redeemer. No other redeemer. Redemption is an act of grace. Boaz was not required to redeem Ruth. Not required. But he chose to. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Jesus made a willing choice. John 10, 17, 18, a says this, The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so that I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, willingly. Jesus chose to go to the cross and die for us. Redemption is public. Boaz redeemed Ruth publicly inside of witnesses. Jesus died on the cross publicly. He redeemed us. Redemption is an act of love. Boaz clearly had interest and love for her. He cared for her, wanted the best for her. Being a Moabite, she was not someone that most men would have chosen to love. But Boaz did. He looked beyond her being a Moabite and sees, saw someone who had converted to Jehovah and saw a woman who, was, who cared for the mother-in-law, someone who was... A, uh, uh, was willing to sacrifice someone who was a servant, and someone of character. He saw that beyond just being a mobile. And likewise, God saw us beyond what the devil locks us in. They were men for destruction. Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners. Why? Because he saw something greater than that. And sin should not hold us back. Amen? Redemption comes with a price. The Redeemer has to pay the price. Yeah, even if it's money. That other Pelo, Peloni and Almoni wasn't willing because the moment he, he would mention about Ruth, if he then cons- had a son with Ruth, then that property that he bought from Naomi would have to be given to that son to continue the line, lineage of Eli Malak and Malon. That's what leverage marriage, right? Basically, the, the closer relative of brother Mary, that wife, that widow, to, in order to conceive a child so that the line, the lineage can continue for that family. Yeah. So that guy was not willing to pay. I'm going to pay something ultimately, I'm not going to get it. Yeah. And then now this is still my son and he's going to also have a say in my estate. So this is no, no. Yeah. There was a price to pay. Boaz was willing to pay the price and we all know Jesus was willing to pay a greater price. The shedding of his blood and his life. Hebrews 9.22 Without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. Amen? Praise God, I got a microphone. Otherwise, I will not be able to compete with the kids. <laughs> this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Redemption is priceless. Cannot be paid for. Ruth had no money to pay back for us. She was a poor widow, a peasant. She could never pay Boaz back. And we too can never pay back Christ for what he has done for us. It is completely unearned and undeserved. That's why no man can boast. It is by grace through faith. No man can boast. No one can say, I did it on my own and I did it my way in heaven. No one can pay back that. And redemption is irreversible. The other relative, once he removed that sandal and gave to Boaz, it is finished, settled. The decision is final. Let me say clearly here so that none of us get mistaken here. Once Jesus saved us, we are saved. Some people go to church. Yep. I remember this comedy joke, you know. The daughter rushed back to home and says, Dad, I got baptized. 
And the father says, again? She said, and this is the uh, 50th time you got baptized? Because there are some people who are never sure. Some people, who, every time the pastor gives an altar call, they'll pull our hand. They're never sure. Okay, once Jesus saves us, we are safe. Once he brings us into a family, he will not throw us out. We are engraved on the palm of God's hand. But of course the question is, once saved, always saved? No. If you decided to jump out of God's hand and say, God, you can keep salvation. I don't want you. Yeah, I, as one of the Muslims would say, Murtad. You know what Murtad is, right? No, okay, never mind. Can we run a BM workshop soon? <laughs> yeah, that means you deny your apostate. You say, I don't want Christ. I walk off. Then you're not safe, lah, right? God put you in the palm of my hands. You decide to jump out and say, Sayonara, God. But God will never take his hand and say, I'm really tired of sham today. Hey, uh. How you like Roti China now? Huh? God won't do that. But sometimes it feels like that. Yep. But God won't do that. Redemption must be accepted. Ruth had to be willing to accept Boaz. She made that proposal. She asked Boaz to redeem her. Boaz did all that work, paid the price. Both sides still had to agree. She, Ruth had to say yes. And Jesus' redemption say he paid the price, he did all the work. We still must say, I accept you. I acknowledge I have sinned against you. I call you my Lord and Savior. I commit my life to you. We must be willing to do that. So it is a reminder in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace. So that's Boaz, a type of Christ. We can see that of being a selfless redeemer. Yeah, try and take that a bit long. We will notice that as a result of that, Boaz was blessed by the elders. Yeah, and they blessed him uh, by saying this. Uh, let me go quickly here. You are witnesses that I bought this land and uh, the land from e Naomi of Eli, Malak, Kilion, and Malon. And with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite wife of Malon, to be my wife. This she can have a son to carry on. The elders now replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming to your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nations of Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. May the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who will be like those of our ancestors, Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. Now, most of us will look at this as this. Who is this people? Ah? Yep. If you have not read Genesis, you will say, who is Rachel and Leah? And then Judah and Tamar. Uh, we have no time to do Genesis today, so it will be very long. So let me quickly say the three, four blessings. Rachel and Leah was the uh, wife of Jacob. In the end, they formed the tribes of Israel because Jacob became Israel. Yeah. Twelve kids, so Rachel and Leah were the matriarch as much as Jacob was the patriarch of Israel. And so to say, basically, their prayer was basically that Ruth will have many kids, fruitful. But more importantly is that they were praying with a wish that Ruth will come to the same level of uh, status as that of Rachel and Leah as matriarch of the children of Israel. Because she's an outsider. And it's always difficult, even though we are converted, to be accepted. And they pray that she would be like Rachel and Leah. A status in such sense. Okay, and then of course, Boaz would be more famous. You know, more rich, etc., etc. And then of course, the last one is Perez. And you will say, who is this Perez fellow? This is another long story, dealing with leverage marriage. Anyway, then from Perez, basically, we can see the lineage down the line coming into Boaz. So they pray that Ruth and Boaz will have that lineage coming down, you know, bringing out goodness into that line. And we can see David and then, of course, down the line, Jesus. But, of course, the marriage of Union of Judah and Tamar is not a great one. So I have no time to tell you that story. <laughs> okay? So you want to read, you can go back and read Genesis 37, I think, or 38. Okay, Naomi. No longer Mara, if you read the last part, right? But Naomi, remember the neighbor women and say, oh, now Naomi got a baby, now she got a son, she got a boy. And Naomi didn't say, shut up, everybody call me Mara. That was what she said in chapter one. God has just touched her heart. 
she was no longer empty but full. God has turned her sorrow into dancing again. She was fulfilled. We can see that in the scripture. I, I'm going to pass that over. I believe you all recognize that. Yeah. Scripture says, You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joys. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you have been going through things and you feel that, you know, God has like turned his hand and squeezed you, like Naomi did. For two, three chapters, she didn't say much. But somehow when she came back, I said in that chapter two, that we was, as a reason why he came back at the beginning of harvest, not just to get food, but it was a reaping time that whatever the enemy had was allowed to steal, God was going to restore to them. And God can do that. Sometimes it is not back to the condition that you wish for. Like even in Job, he lost his whole family and everything, but he gained a new family at the end. It wasn't the resurrection of his old family, but the coming of a new one. We don't get that, but we get something else. Why? God has his greater purpose. But we know you, God will show you the path of life and in his presence is fullness of joy. Amen? And of course, Ruth, radiance. I, I, I see three things here for Ruth. She was redeemed. Her life. Otherwise, she would be that widow forever. I, I don't know about what, if you just could picture, if you're a widow and your mother-in-law don't plan to work, She's not going to go to the field. You are the one who say, where you go, I will follow. So for the rest of her life, she will be gleaning from someone's field. Okay? And for a four-month period, the rest of the time, you have to find something to do. And as you grow older, it's going to be harder to bend down and glean. That is if Naomi lives very old. But God redeem her life. Once she was a widow, now she's married. Redeemed the family that she had none. Yep. And redeemed her future. Now she has her future. Rewarded her faith. She chose to follow Naomi and says, your God will be my God. And basically, she trusted that God would do something. He didn't say that, but by her very actions to follow all the way through and to do what she needed to do Yep, and to just trust that things will turn out better and God rewarded the faith. And one other thing is I saw realignment. You know, she was a mobile. She was an outsider. But God grafted her into that lineage where Christ would come. David would be there, that line. And so important, a reminder to us, we are all outsiders. We are all outsiders. But God brought us in, into his kingdom. Amen. And so, basically, Ruth was a blessing to Naomi, blessing to Bethlehem, blessing to Boaz, blessing to Israel, and Ruth is a blessing to the world. It is a very remarkable book because it is a book where very little is mentioned about the name, of the person who the book is named after, other than she went to the field, made an interesting wedding proposal to someone. Most of the time, she is quiet. And chapter 4, the last chapter, totally no mention of Ruth speaking anything at all or in action, nothing. It was all about boss. It's all about, at the end, about Naomi. Never even say Ruth carried a baby. <laughs> it was Naomi. It was always for other people. But Ruth, God saw her, that graciousness in her. God saw that she was a person that is worthy to be in that lineage of Christ. So if you can see the lineage of Christ after David, then it will be Jesus. Now some of you might say, Judah and Tamar, I thought it was bad union. Yeah, but God always redeems that bad. You know, the one thing about those of you who are new Christians, the Bible doesn't hide, you know, uh, ugly stuff of people. In other words, it is showing us today they were ordinary men and women like you and I. If the Bible was written about you and I today, then you will talk about somebody was actually a gay, but now you got saved, or whatever. 
that God doesn't hide that. You are talking about men and women who are not perfect. In fact, the Bible doesn't even show any perfect family. Most of the family are all dysfunctional. Even Abraham and David himself, men of the God, no functional family. They're all dysfunctional, imperfect. But what God is saying, see in the imperfectness where my grace, my hope, yeah, my faithfulness is reflected and my love. And that's what an assurance for each one of us here, that we are imperfect. We are people that is, has mistakes. But God would accept us, but never to remain the same so that we can be changed by His goodness. And I know most of you know this, and I pray today that in that knowing of this, read about it, heard about it, because most of us have has sent message all around, that you will receive it. That they allow that God to turn that mess in your life into a message. Allow God to take that test and turn it into a testimony. Allow God to take that trial and turn it into a triumph. And that you will get out of being a victim and say, why me, why me, into a victory. And that is so important. Today, let me end with this, the last person. The Bible is always talking about Jesus. And that is so important. The word redemption is about gaining back something in exchange for payment, the clearing of a debt. Bible says God bought you with a high price. God bought you with a high price and so you must honour God with your body. Let me once again reiterate to you. Today if you are coming here for the first time, we are reminded that for all of us have sinned fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. Now this is important. When we talk about repentance, I say it many times, a lot of times for those who are Pentecost charismatic, we tend to think repentance is one of those things. And those of us who are not Pentecostal, we tend to think it's just about hate knowledge. It involves the entire person. We must first understand that we are sinners. In other words, there are no brainless Christians. Nobody, you know, you went gong gong to church and they, you gong gong become Christian. Gong gong means blur blur in Hokkien. And somehow, you know, you were caught up with this girl in church and you, when they push you in the pool, you were also blur. No, you knew in your mind what sin was. You recognized, you understood what sin was. You are clear about it. That sin cuts you off from God. Sin is, we all fall short from the standard of God. We all, no matter how great you are, how good you are, how intelligent you are, how many tons of PhD you have, how much money you give to people, we still fall short about it. Because at the very core here, we are sinners, cut away from God. None of us. And you recognize that. And by recognizing it, the Spirit of God brings a conviction and godly sorrow stirs your heart to repent. And as a result of understanding it and the conviction, we make a willing choice out of our own volition and say, no longer devil, no longer sin. I don't want that anymore. Today, I repent and turn. And from then on, you willingly walk the walk of faith and the values of God imputed in your lives as you carry on. So that it makes sense now when Jesus says, love God, with all your heart, with all your, all your strength. So that this morning when you sing, I understood what I'm singing. I'm clear about it. Because it has hit me in my heart and I know what I believe. And I do it with my will. And even when my body doesn't want to sing today, wake up because I will praise the Lord. And I'll thank the Lord. It has to go in line. But when we get someone understand the gospel halfway, I don't wasn't clear about it. I just felt woo. Nothing wrong with woo. That's why after woo, we ask you to come for class so that we woo you properly. So that you understand clearly. So that when you get baptized, we always ask you the question. Sometimes you might see me smile, a funny smile, when people testify. Oh, today I want to be baptized because. All my friends are here. The last time I heard that was when I did deliverance. 
this guy fell slain there, you know, he closed his eyes. And then, and I told you, you know, that Kawang Ye outside, and he opened his eyes. Only thing missing was a thunder, lightning. And he said, My friends are here. He said, Why is it important to be sure? Because when you go to heaven and Jesus asks you, Hey, why did you come to heaven? Because my friends are here. You know, a lot of my friends say, I don't want to go to heaven because all my friends are down there. How? Uh, on the funny day, you have one bunch of friends they say, Hey, come here, come here. The beer is cheap here. It doesn't work that way. We have to be clear. Do we understand that? As long as we don't understand that we have sinned, we will never be convicted to turn to God. And the reason why we struggle not turning is because we don't think we have sinned. We are pretty good. And therefore, there is no godly sorrow within us. But if we understand that we have sinned, that God shows His love for us that while we are yet sinners, people who don't deserve it, that deserves their Christ would die for us, take our place on the cross. What is the wages of sin? Death. Someone is willing to die for you. Yeah? But the gift of God is eternal life. But there is hope. If it's just that first part of the scripture, the wages of sin is death, and all of us have sinned, then it is a sad, sad story. But because there is eternal life in Christ Jesus, and that is free, it is a gift. What must we do? Just like Ruth must accept Boaz's offer. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Today, I just want to challenge you. If you are here, you have heard the gospel many times, you have not made a choice to accept that offer, do accept it. Don't wait. Don't wait. It is a gift. It is free. All you need to do is come to Christ in prayer. Confess your sins to Him. Tell Him that you're willing to receive this gift. Tell Him that you are willing to be redeemed by Him and that this day you will commit your life and call Him Lord and Savior. And you have more questions, ask any of the leaders here or the pastors here. The next thing, if you have received Jesus' offer of redemption as Christian, are you satisfied? Are you reading radiating the love of Christ. Do you realize how blessed you are? Turn to the person next to you and say, hey, you are blessed. Just to make sure they are awake also. Yep. God has given your life with good gifts. So he has blessed it. And you have to be thankful. You know, we have to make a choice to resolve not being Mara and choosing to be Naomi. And if you're going through pains and difficulties, let me tell you, that's the reality of life. In this church, a lot of us are growing older. Yeah? If you can get out of bed, nothing spinning and no aching, praise God! Some of you say, Pastor, why are you so negative? This is the reality for older people. One day when you reach the age, we will give you a high five. This is the reality of life. Yeah? It is. In fact, actually, when you hit 30, some of these young fellows say, oh, you're now a lot more tired than before. Yep. I also cannot run after the children in children's class. Yeah. And those of us of 40, 50, I also cannot hear anymore their sound. Cry or not. But this is the reality of it. But we allow things to, to be offended because somehow someone has preached a wrong gospel to us and tell you as Christian, you will have no pain. In a Christian, you only prosper. Not that we are against prosperity. Are we against? Well, no. God bless you. Chun. Remember, give your offering in thanks. God bless you, ma. Yeah. God can heal, yes. But there will be one time we pray all we want and fast 50 days or more than 40 days and you will die. Because God say, time to go home. But if you say, no, I don't want to go home because here is better then maybe your salvation wasn't pretty clear. Because heaven is supposed to be a better place than here. In this world, the Bible says there will be tribulation. But as long as we are here, choose to be better, not bitter. Choose to be Naomi, pleasant, not Mara. 
he goes much better. Better for people all around you also. Yes? Betul or not? Really? I know you know what I mean. Yep. Otherwise, uh, I'm coming to a stage where I got to realize because one of these days you're going to be a grouchy old man or old woman. <laughs> right? And you say, I will never be like that. But you re- start to recognize your grouchiness right now, then you should do something about it. Thirdly, the greatest thing is this. It's so important. If you believe Jesus redeems you with his own life, it's a great news. Then our call is to spread it. If we don't spread it, others will never come to know Jesus Christ. Amen? So we're going to pray right now. If, if you want to make that choice to follow Jesus, as you look as Boaz in this story, you know, and you recognize the type that of Christ that we see in Boaz, there can only be one Redeemer. You know, there's, there's no such thing as all religion leads to the same place. No. Yeah, all roads might lead to Rome. Yeah. But there is only one way for salvation. Not many ways. Not many ways. And Jesus says, the Bible tells us that not by works, not by our abilities, not by any other means, yeah? not by money, not by our so-called self-righteousness can we buy our way into heaven. Yeah? I always tell people this, if it's that way, it looks really like Malaysia. You can buy your way. I'm talking about this country somewhere, you know. It looks like the world. You know, when I was in a law firm, whenever I joined my boss for his parties, people were always throwing him, you know this Tansri, you know, you know this Dato. And all I can say, I only know Jesus. I don't know all this Dato. Ah, you don't know Dato so and so, how you want to close this deal, how long you have this, you're going to panel, you know, get a panel company, you must know this Tansri, ma. And we all know, you need to know this name, that name, to get into the, some form of connection. But you only need to know one name to get into heaven. And one name to life forevermore. That is Jesus Christ. And that is the only name that is given above every other name. So today, if you want to make a choice to follow him, all you need to do, as we always say, admit that you're a sinner. You understand it clearly what sin is. Sin is not just outside actions, but what goes in our hearts that nobody sees but God sees. We might not kill someone, but if our heart has murder in it, it is sin. We might not do it outside, but in our hearts we feel like doing it is sin. Because out we do it as our actions are a lot of times the reflection of our hearts. What conceived here in our minds. And that is so important. And so today, if you admit that you're a sinner, you admit that you have sinned against God, you admit that you need Him. B, you believe that He died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty of sin for your life. He made that way open to the throne of grace. Then today, see, you will commit your life to Him and call Him your Lord, Savior, and Master. D, you do that by declaring that in a prayer. And this day, if you do it, E, you have eternal life. And then F, you have fellowship with God. And then you go into this whole world and tell other people of the goodness. And then one day when it all ends, you go H, heaven. I have no time to go Z. Okay? But let's pray right now. Father, just repeat after me. Father, today, I admit I am a sinner. Today, I admit I have sinned against you. Today, I admit that I need you. Today, I believe on your saving grace that Christ would die for my sins, that on the cross, He took the penalty of sin for me. He died for me so that I can have life. So today, I commit my life to Him. I call you my Lord, my Savior, my Master. Today, I worship you in Jesus' name.
If you have prayed that prayer for the first time, or you have prayed again this time, and you are sure, talk to me, or talk to Pastor Karin, or any of our leaders, so that we can teach you more about the Word of God. I want to pray for those who already are walking the, the things of God. If you are going through an issue in your life, and, and you feel a lot of times you are like Mara, you feel like God let you down. You you feel that other Christians let you down. You you feel the world let you down. Life let you down. This day, I, I just want you as you look at the story in Ruth, that God can turn that which is empty into fullness, and God can take that was oh Lord, man that that was destroyed and breathe new life into it. God can put a new path, realign, redeem, restore. But you got to look to Him. Would you do where, where you are? You at? If you want to stand, you can stand. Put your hand where you you might going through. If you're going through a sickness, if you're going through pain, or if you are going through a, a situation relationship, then put your hand at your heart. But if you are not well, put your hand at where that part requires healing. Let's let's stand as as a people of God. And if you might be not going through anything. Then they ask God to refresh your faith and stir up your faith once again this day. Let us pray, as we, Father. We stand here as a people, acknowledging Lord how much we need you, O oh Lord. That as we see in the story of Ruth, O oh Lord, and Naomi, that you can change that seem so bleak into life once again. That you would bring, O oh Lord, restoration and realignment and redemption even in life of Ruth and Naomi. That you bring, give them a future, and sometimes, Lord, when things are going against us, we see no light at the end of the tunnel. We see no future, but yet, Lord, you are the Father of lights. And this day, I pray, Father of lights, let your light so shine in each of our hearts and mind right now. Clear off the darkness, break every negative thoughts of the enemy in our minds, every condemnation, every rejection, every hurt, every anger. Every offenses, the Lord. Every every lie and voices of the enemy that comes and say that we're not good enough. God has turned Himself against you. All those, Father, be taken captivity according to Your Word right now and pull down every one of those strongholds and destroy it in the name of Jesus. Then instead, Father, we pray right now for that which is holy, for that which is pure, for that which is good, praiseworthy of Your name. That which is of your truth that will set us free. That which is of your shalom that brings wholeness and completeness. Oh Lord, saturate our minds and hearts right now. So that Lord, it is your truth that we stand on. It is life that Lord, we receive. Lord, it is clarity and not confusion in our minds this day. Father, we speak that into each one of us right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for the transformation of our mindset. And our heart, even right now, that our minds will be set on you, not on all our circumstances, not on a negative report, O oh Lord. And we choose to receive your good report. That in you, O oh Lord, we are healed. That in you we are made strong, O oh Lord. That in our weakness, your strength is made perfect, bringing order, bringing restoration of function and strength into our body, bringing O oh Lord clarity and strength in our spiritual being, O oh Lord, and our mental and emotional being. This day, Father, O oh Lord, we take hold of your strength. O oh Lord, Lord, we pray for those, O oh Lord, who are lacking, that you are their sufficiency. And for each one of us, Father, you are our God, the Lord of our coming and going, the ruler of our day and night. That if you are for us, who can be against us? And so this day, we acknowledge who you are right now. Breaking every hole of sickness, breaking hole of every hole of lack, of defeat, Confusion, lie, O oh Lord, and breaking hold of every form of bitterness and offenses that will be broken in Jesus' name. And this day we choose to receive that life abundantly. O oh Lord, we choose to take hold of your joy to be our strength. That Lord, we want to proclaim that you would turn our mourning into dancing again, and you will give us beauty instead of ashes, all of joy. Oh Lord, instead of mourning, garments of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. The Lord, we will speak that right now over each one of us that you receive that in the name of Jesus. The all of joy running and stirring you once again. The garments of praise, the dries of darkness, and beauty instead of ashes. Beauty instead of ashes. Beauty instead of ashes. 
in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus receive that right now in the name of Jesus and then Father as a people Lord we pray may we carry the message that you're a God that can turn ashes into beauty you're a God that can turn mourning into dancing and you can a God that breathes life instead of death to a world that needs to hear that in Jesus name Amen. Amen Hallelujah Jesus I believe in you Jesus I belong to you you're the reason that I live the reason that I sing Jesus I believe in you Jesus I belong to you you're the reason that I live the reason that I sing with all I am let's sing that again Jesus I believe Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live, the reason that I sing. Jesus, I believe. Lord, we declare that in this place. In so our lives Jesus I belong to you you're the reason that I live the reason that I sing with all I am you're the reason you're the reason that I live the reason that With all I am. Let's lift up our hands. Thank you, Father, for today. And as we have declared this is a day you have made according to your word, we choose to rejoice. Let it be a day of your goodness and mercy, a day of your healing, a day of your breakthrough, a day of your victory for each one of us. And let it overflow in the coming week in all that we do be it in our homes, be in our relationships, in our business dealings, Lord, in our different issues and challenges, in our studies, in our college and schools, oh Lord, and wherever you position us, let your breakthrough and victory overflow. Your goodness permeates our homes, our offices, Lord, so that, oh Lord, a difference is there because, God, you are in the house. And when you are in the house, something great and miraculous will always happen. And so we take that, Father. We release that right now. And as you go, go in His name. And go in His powerful anointing that empowers you. May the love of the Father, grace of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Next week we have Pastor Victor Wong who will be coming to share the word. He so happens to be in town. So I'm going to get him to speak. Amen. Bring your friends.